Good morning. We're going to begin a new series right now in Mark's Gospel and study through this Gospel verse by verse. Now we may take a break from time to time to look at something topical and something different, but in this way we can really get hold of the Word of God. So we're going to start, of course, Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. But before we do, let's say a word about Mark. Who was he? As far as we understand, he was John Mark, in whose home, at least in his parents' home, was the place where they held the Last Supper, the upper room. So he lived in Jerusalem. And obviously because of this, he got close to the different disciples. It is believed by many that it was Peter who gave Mark most of the information that he needed for this gospel. However, what we also find is that he came into the story later on. He went with Paul on a missionary journey and they didn't get on too well. In fact, they got on so badly that he went back home to mum. I don't know that I blame John Mark for that. Later on he went again and he was with Paul. So John Mark was very involved in the New Testament church. He was obviously eyewitness to some accounts. From the account of the Garden of Gethsemane, he was there watching and had to run for it when the soldiers came to take Jesus away. So this is John Mark, and he writes very directly and very concisely. He doesn't give us any birth stories of Jesus. He begins with John the Baptist. Let's look at the text, Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. The beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Remember always the gospel is the good news. The good news is simple, that Jesus Christ came into this world, the Son of God, to die on the cross to take away your sins. That's the good news. That's the gospel. But it's never good news to you until you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Then in verse 2, Mark goes on to say, It is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight paths for him. John the Baptist came into this world in a very fascinating role. He came to point others to Jesus. When I was ordained in England, the dean of my college was there to give the sermon. And he spoke to me about John the Baptist, and he literally did that. He made me sit in the front row of our church. No one was to sit with me. I was to sit on my own. There were about 600 people there, and he addressed me. He allowed them to listen. But some of the things he said have stayed with me ever since. He said to me, Remember that John the Baptist was a signpost, pointing people away from himself to Jesus. That is my task. It always has been. As a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm here to point others away from me to Jesus. Constantly pointing to Jesus Christ. That's the work of those who serve Jesus Christ as his preachers, as his ministers. Now here's John the Baptist as the forerunner, and he was literally a signpost pointing us to Jesus. And he did it in a fantastic way. He comes out with that incredible statement, I must decrease, he must increase. A statement that each one of us should learn. A statement that each one of us should absorb and bring into our own lifestyle. That we should continually decrease, that Jesus Christ within us can increase. But what else does John say about this man? He says, and so John came baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, John the Baptist lived a wild sort of life. We find that he took the Nazarene vow. He didn't shave his head. He didn't drink any intoxicating drink. And he lived a very separate life, almost like a hermit. Some people believe that he joined a group called the Essenes. That is not certain. But what is certain is that they lived in an area very close to where John was baptizing. As we understand it, John was baptizing in the River Jordan, very close to where it enters the Dead Sea. This is down south and it's very close to Jericho. It's a very wild part. The Judean wilderness is the most wild spot I'd ever seen in my life. There's very little rainfall there, under an inch a year. And it isn't a sandy desert, it's a dusty and rocky desert. But very, very wild countryside. 
Now, this is where John lived. His clothing wasn't great, as we'll see in a minute. But notice what he was doing. He was baptizing in the desert region and preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I mentioned this on the program before. But when you come to the subject of baptism, you find there's a progression through the New Testament. This is where it begins, but it didn't actually begin there in fact. The Jews began using baptism to baptize proselytes. Well, who were proselytes? They were Gentiles who became part of the Jewish faith. They accepted the Jewish faith, and they were baptized. Now, John the Baptist took that as a sign of repentance, and notice straight away that so far as his baptism was concerned, it was for the forgiveness of sins. In fact, it says very clearly in the next verse, verse 5, the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the river Jordan. As they confessed, they were baptized. That was the whole point of his baptism. Now, remember what I've just said, because it becomes important. Later on, Jesus baptized, although he didn't himself, his disciples did. This is told us in John chapter 4, and you can take a look at that. But here was this man baptizing for the repentance of sins, the forgiveness of sins. As people repented, they were baptized. When Jesus baptized, apparently, it seems it was for discipleship that these people were following him, and no doubt repentance was involved. Then into the New Testament church, and we're told that on the day of Pentecost, the disciples baptized 3,000 people, confessing their sins, becoming disciples, and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Notice that there is a progression of baptism in the New Testament order. Now, come back to these folks. They came, they confessed their sins, and John baptized them in the River Jordan. It seems from Romans chapter 6 that the only baptism we find in the New Testament is the baptism by immersion. What does that mean? That the person is put completely under the water. Why? Well, then we get to the theology of baptism. Certainly in the New Testament church, it was practiced with a very beautiful symbolism. And the symbolism is simple. When the person is put under the water, they die with Christ in baptism. Their sins are buried with Jesus Christ. And then as they come up out of the water, they are coming up to a newness of life. Now, if I baptize someone in that way, that has already happened in their life. They've accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. So they have had that experience of dying to Christ and now living a new life in Him. Will you say, just a minute, Richard, why do you baptize them? Because they are now giving that sign to anyone who wants to know that they belong to Jesus, that their old life is dead, that they have a new life in Him. That's the picture of believer's baptism. Now notice what I did not say. I did not say adult baptism. I said believer's baptism. Because quite obviously in the New Testament, whatever you say about the mode of baptism, one thing is certain. The only people who were baptized in the New Testament church were those who believed. And I think that's a practice we need to follow in the church today. Let's come back to the scene. Let's take another look at John. Fantastic looking man. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. Whichever way you put it, this man must have been a scary sight. I'm quite convinced that most places would have stopped him going into the church. He didn't shave. He had this wild look. He had these wild clothes, what clothes he had. And his menu wasn't very great, was it? How many of us would want to eat locusts and wild honey? But there wouldn't be anything else in the whole of the desert. That's why he ate it. So here's this man chosen of God, chosen to be the forerunner of the Son of God, and here he is with this incredible look. Also, we find that his preaching was extremely direct. When he spoke, you didn't go for a sermon tickler. We find in the other Gospels that what he said was very, very clear. But something else, verse 7, his message was, After me will come one more powerful than I, the throngs of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. 
Now, of course, from the Jewish point of view in that day, he's saying much more than I've just read to you. He's saying that this one coming after him was way above him. And as he says in John's Gospel, he was preferred before me because he was before me. He's acknowledging that Jesus had pre-existence. John recognized who Jesus was. And John preached the fact that he was the Son of God. Now, he recognized all that and he talked about all that. But notice right here, will you, that it goes on to say, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Now, sometimes we find in our different church doctrines that people will tell you there's only one baptism. It's a baptism in water. I don't agree with that, and John the Baptist doesn't. He obviously says there are two. He says, I baptize you with water, but the one who will come after me will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? I think very simply this. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. For the Holy Spirit is the agent of the Father and Son. What have I just said? Very simply. I've just said to you that once you become a Christian, God dwells in you. And he dwells in you by his Holy Spirit. The snag is this. Many people have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit doesn't always have the individual. And it's when you surrender to Jesus Christ and give yourself to him that the Holy Spirit who is within you is set free to fill you, to overflow you, to flow through every part of your being. And I believe that's when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit. There may be some manifestation of his power, there may be not. But the fact is, it's when you surrender to him. Sometimes it happens on your own, on your knees, in your bedroom. Sometimes it happens when someone prays for you. It's obvious in the New Testament it happened when hands were laid on and there were prayer. And that still happens today. The Holy Spirit will never be restricted to any one method. He is God. He is sovereign. He works the way he wants to work. But it's one thing we need. We need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, immersed in the Holy Spirit, that's our greatest need. If you haven't experienced it, that's something you need in your Christian walk. And that's what John the Baptist was talking about that day.